Manscaped presents Out of the Park with Barry Davis. Also brought to you by our partners at Foundation Physiotherapy, Ballistic Sports, and Georgetown Honda. This week, we go behind the scenes with John Gibbons to learn that even the best of Blue Jays teams have some pretty big bumps from time to time. Josh was probably the most disliked in the game. Hosey was, you know, they were battling out for one and two. And for the same reason. You know, they both showed up to play. They both great competitors. They're both best players in the game. But they were, they were emotional. And now, I'd like to ask Edwin Encarnacion, if you're out there somewhere, could you come and help our team out? Because Barry and I are bickering all the time. And well, anyways, here's Barry Davis. I got to tell you something, Tom. There are some things that we hear from John Gibbons in this chat that I've never heard John Gibbons say. And I've been around Gibby for an awfully long time, and I've heard a lot of things, and I've talked to him on the record and off the record. Uh, he brings to light some very interesting things, including what you're talking about, some of the, uh, I don't know if you'd call it turmoil, unrest, but the clubhouse with the Blue Jays in 15 and 16 was not all as rosy as we thought it was. And we'll find that out from John Gibbons. He also takes us behind the scenes in his dust-up with Ted Lilly. Also, the time that he told Kevin Pillar, you need to go down to the minors. And that turned Kevin's career around. A great conversation with Kevin Pillar, including our OTP insiders who once again bring it and ask some fantastic questions. So we have that to look forward to. We will also speak with a Detroit Tigers prospect. And Tom, why are we going to talk to a Detroit Tigers prospect? Well, Barry, as you know, we'd like to talk to any prospects out there that are rising their way. We love that part of the story. It's kind of my, it's one of my favorite parts that we do. But this particular Tigers prospect has something pretty special going for him. He might be one of the very first Prince Edward Islanders to ever make the majors. That's right. Cole McLaren will join us. He's a catcher in the Tigers organization. And uh, we get some good tips on places to go in PEI as well. Raj Sapaya will give us an update on yet another Toronto Blue Jays injury. Remember Corey Dickerson, the guy the Blue Jays got in the trade? We haven't seen him play yet. Why not? What is going on with that contusion in his foot? Raj Sapaya, Foundation Physiotherapy, will fill us in on that. Up next, though, Tom, you see it behind you. The Jays are going home. There's Tom Forth. I'm Barry Davis. You're listening to and watching Out of the Park. A play ball! Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, the first pitch with Barry Davis. And the first pitch is brought to you by our good pals at Manscaped.com. Manscaped, right there. It is the 4.0. It is the lawnmower. Tom and I both are very proud owners of the lawnmower, and you can get yours for a wonderful discount by using the promo code out of the park. Tom, what can we say about these folks? We also have the ear and nose trimmers now from these guys. Awesome, awesome products, and you can get a great discount with us. Yeah, you can't get better. You can't get better value, especially with a 20% off discount. You can take these things. You can use them in the shower. You can use them in the rain. You could probably take them swimming with you and do it in there if you were so inclined, although I have no oh, idea why man. you might be. That being said, they're rugged tools. They're great precision. Thousands of RPMs. Grooming, power. Take care of your good bits. Take care of your naughty bits. Take care of every part of yourself. Manscaped.com. Use the promo code out of the park. If you ever do that in a swimming pool, please let me know because I yeah, shall I never that. swim. I shall never swim in a pool that you actually shaved in. Okay. Yeah, my apologies. <laughs> Sometimes when you're ad libbing lines, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> For those that are uh, watching on YouTube, first of all, if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening, that's great. But if you'd like to watch, you just have to subscribe to Out of the Park on YouTube. Doesn't cost you a penny, and you can catch up with all of our episodes. When we are recording this right now, the Blue Jays have been rained out, so there's no game. So it's a great opportunity to sit and catch up on some great chats we've had. You can also listen to us anywhere that you get your podcasts, including Spotify and iTunes. Rogers Center, Sky Dome, is going to be home for baseball again. Jays have not played a home game since 2019. They finally got it done. We're going to see baseball Looking at about, what, 15,000 fans are going to allow in to start. Tom, I think this this might this might be a little boost that the Toronto Blue Jays need to make their run. Cannot 
you cannot understate or overstate how important it is to have home games. No, and and this is something that I did not. I think I, I I've on this show numerous times said there's no way they were playing here in 2021, but here we are, and it's amazing. Yeah, we're we're less less than two weeks away, is it? By by the time we air this, mm-hmm. and we're actually going to have home games at the dome. In honor of that, I've got my background going today. And, That's beautiful. Uh, you know, I couldn't be happier to be wrong about this. I didn't think there was any way that we would have said. But again, every time we talk about it, COVID teaches us lessons, right? You can never know what's coming around the corner. And this is a nice surprise for Toronto fans. It really is. I, I, I'm thrilled that they're coming back to Toronto. Uh, let's hope we get radio broadcasts back again. <laughs> that would be really nice. Uh, ben Wagner does such a great job. I'd love to hear his voice again on the radio. But we are getting into a little bit of normalcy. Uh, Tom, usually we yak on a lot more about baseball, but we've got so much coming up on the show. So let's not waste any more time, shall we? Let's head off now to Prince Edward Island. Well, we are honored now to be joined by PEI native, and now a member of the Detroit Tigers organization, uh, Cole McLaren, we're not going to hold that against you. We're fine with you being a Tiger. If you said you were a Yankee uh, or a Red Sox, we'd probably say not a chance in hell. But uh, for sure, we're, we're, we're happy, happy to have to. we're happy to have you on the show. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. First and foremost, I mean, man, just seeing your story and what has gone on with you over the last couple of years, it, it's pretty much a, a wild whirlwind story. I mean. You were you weren't drafted, uh, and then you were you were signed as an undrafted free agent. So yeah. first of all, we've talked to many players about what draft day was like and that anticipation and that expectation. What do you remember about draft day? And and what, were you almost at a point when you weren't drafted of thinking, well, I guess baseball is not going to be my thing full time? Yeah, I mean. With the draft, it happens over a course of three days, right? So I knew that um, being a senior um, coming out of college, I knew if I was going to get my name called, it was going to be on the third day. Um, so, you know, I was just kind of went about it in a normal way, just, just kind of hanging around the house, not really doing too much. And then, you know, the, the day is over and you don't get to hear your name called and you kind of have to go to plan B and, understand that you know baseball might be over um you know i still um knew and hoped that there was a chance that i could be an undrafted free agent um especially being a catcher you know teams are always looking for for catchers just for you know defensive replacements if anything um so yeah draft day was was a little bit of a disappointment but um you know i still knew there was a chance that uh, i could still get the opportunity to, to sign um, professionally so and uh, the Tigers called I think a week or two after the draft um, and yeah they had me on a plane two days after the call and, and we got the ball rolling so looking at it you know now a little bit removed from the situation um, was it a better thing for you that you didn't get drafted like is has your minor league career started off in a better place because you were an unsigned free agent or you were a signed free agent or would it have been better had you gotten drafted maybe? Um, I really don't think it would have made too much of a difference if I was drafted um, compared to me not getting drafted. Right. Um, the money was still the same. Um, you know, senior sign guys out of high school, or out of college. Sorry. Um, we tend to, to just sign for whatever, right. Because it's our last opportunity to keep playing baseball. Um, so I don't think if I were drafted, it would have changed um, really anything when I when I first got to to Tiger Town down in Lakeland. So, so Cole, you kind of yada 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 over the best part of your entire story. So we're gonna get you to tell it because here you are, you're at your little brother's high school graduation, yes, where you're not even supposed to have your phone turned on, <laughs> right? And so, first of all, did you forget to turn on your phone, or are you just like me and say, "I'll oh, screw it," you know, I'm gonna have my phone on because I, uh, I need it? Because you got you, that's how you found out that the Tigers were were signing you, right? Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Um, so yeah, we were just sitting at the um, graduation ceremony, and I got a text from Coach Mike Bell that coached me at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and he was like, "You know, have your phone on you the, these next couple hours." Um, 
you know, you're going to expect a phone call that you're going to really like. I was like, the heck is that going to be now? So anyway, I kept my phone on me and then probably halfway through the ceremony, the uh, Matt Smuda, the area scout for, for the, the Pittsburgh area with the Tigers, gave me a call and said they wanted to sign me with the uh, undrafted free agent minor league deal. So you know, that was a pretty, pretty good call to get. Um, you know, I didn't want to take anything away from my little brother and his big graduation, but, um, you know, he was, he was pretty understanding and he was just as excited as I was. So. so let me ask you this. What was closer to the, the reality of what happened? You're sitting in there, you get a text and you go, okay, cool. A, B, did you go, holy shit, I just got signed. Or C, did you kind of go, uh, like you're holding it in because you're like, I just got freaking signed, but I don't want to steal this. What was going through your mind? Like, what, were one of those three what really happened with you? Yeah, so I, I actually, whenever the call came, I actually got up and left. I went outside. I went into the parking lot because um, I just didn't know what to expect. I wanted to, you know, it, experience it with nobody looking at me. So it was kind of a a mix between two and three, you know, like <laughs> I did give a little bit of a celebration, but I didn't bask in it too long. I kind of got right back in there and um, congratulated my brother for for graduating high school. But yeah, there was. Did a, you tell him right away? Like when you like after you got the news, did you? Yeah. Kinda... So he, whenever he came back and sat down at the table for the for the meal, uh, that's when that's when I told him. I told my parents right away because they were sitting right beside me. Um, and they kind of kept their their emotions within themselves. Um, but once we got home, it was kind of a, a little bit more of a celebration. You know, when we talk with a lot of Canadian born players, one of the natural questions that comes up is, you know, what drew you to baseball as opposed to hockey? Although I suppose being from PEI, the question would be what drew you to baseball as opposed to golf? Yeah, um, you know, I played hockey and golf just as long as I played baseball. Um, you know, I grew up skating on the river. Um, you know, I took, I can remember taking golf lessons when I was maybe eight, eight or nine years old. Um, but I don't know what, what it was that, that drew me to baseball. Um, I think it was just always a sport I loved. I always thought that, you know, I was better at it per se than I was at hockey or golf. And maybe I saw a little more of a future in it for me. Um, but, you know, just like any other Canadian kid, I played hockey in the wintertime and then played golf and baseball in the summertime. Um, it was pretty, pretty normal uh, life growing up. And then I think it was maybe when I was 16, I decided to, to kind of focus more on baseball throughout the winter and I, and I stopped playing hockey. How hard is that to do in PEI? I mean, even, you know, even here in Ontario or anywhere in Canada, we can play baseball all summer. I mean, Tom's son is a pitcher and plays all summer, but, uh, you know, other than doing some indoor things, it's yeah. pretty hard to get that competitive baseball going in the off season. So what do you do? And I know you ended up going to college in Pittsburgh, which is another thing. Like there's not really a lot of great Canadian opportunities. Like if you want to make it, you've got to go to the States, but like, how did you maintain your baseball skills when you don't really have the facilities or the manpower to keep it going. Right. So, um, for my, I think it was my grade 10 year. Um, I was still back in PEI. Um, there was a program called the Eastern baseball Academy. I think we worked out two or three times a week, um, in a big indoor turf sock facility. Um, so we did that, um, two or three times a week. And then, um, my like grade 11, 12 year, I actually moved out to Okotoks, Alberta, and played for the Okotoks Dogs Baseball Academy, um, which I'm not too sure if you're familiar with them, but they have a beautiful, oh, yeah. b- beautiful indoor facility um, up there. A ton of coaches with great experience. Um, some guys got pro experience, college experience. Um, so I moved out there for grade 11 and 12. Um, and spending two winters out there, man, that was crucial for my development. Um, you know, we, we got after it indoors. We really didn't care that, that we were indoors and couldn't get outside. Um, we, we went about every day as if it was sunny and 75 out there. Right. 
Um, so yeah, I think, you know, getting better in the winter time is based on, on development and not feeling sorry, um, feeling sorry for yourself about your situation that you're not getting outside every day. Um, you know, you just got to work with the courage you dealt. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to, to hear of like a program like the Okotoks. Um, even from when you started in baseball to now, um, are there more of those programs hop like popping up in Canada so that people don't have to travel halfway across the country to get involved in high level baseball? Um, you know, on the East coast, not really. Um, there's just not enough interest, I guess, um, to play baseball at that kind of a level year round. Um, but you know, as you go more west, or I think there's a couple more programs that might be popping up here and there, maybe in Saskatchewan and um, places like that. But in terms of out on the East Coast, there's a couple programs I know that are trying to do the the full winter thing and and go down to some tournaments down in the state, which is which is awesome to see. But I think there's only going to be room for maybe one or two of those programs on the East Coast just with it being so small and the interest pool not being as big as, you know, Ontario or out West. All right. You ready for some trivia? All right. Let's, let's, let's do it, Barry. All right. Three major league players in history from Prince Edward Island. Any idea? Can you name one of the three that have played in the major leagues? Vern Handerhan. Oh, he's got one. That was the easy one. That was the easy one. Now, the other two in the major leagues. Yeah. Uh, too sure. Yeah, yeah, it's because you got to you got to go back to the 19th century. Oh, yeah. Okay, so like the 18th. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, George Wood and Henry Oxley. So next time you're home in PEI, go into the local library and look these two dudes up. But I'll have to look those boys up. Like, has it ever crossed your mind or even your family's mind what it would mean for the province of PEI or, you know, the East Coast in general? Mm -hmm. you know to have you play in the major leagues i mean that's a pretty freaking big deal yeah man it's it would uh it would be a, a feat that you know it would go down in history um you know it's, it's a very long road um but you know if things happen where i get to make a debut then you know it would be awesome for, for the whole east coast and you know kids growing up that you know they can see that somebody from, from little old PEI did it. And, you know, that can give them a little bit of motivation to say that they can do it someday. So in your heart of hearts, you know, looking at your season, the season you're having, a lot of catchers, when they get to double A, they see that offense kind of fall off because they're working so hard on, on the catcher pitcher duties. You're hitting 300 at double A this year. So in your heart of hearts, when, when talk turns to the major leagues, what are what are you hoping for? What's your timeline? How long till you're gonna crack that wall? Jeez, it could be it could be years, man. Um, I really don't have a timeline to give you. Um, yeah, that, that's a pretty tough question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I hope it's sooner than later, but I really can't can't put a number on it. You know, just with with so many things happening and depth charts and, and injuries, you know, it, it maybe it. It could never happen, you know. It, more guys than not, it never happens, right? Um, you know, so it's tough for me to put a number on it. <laughs> Don't worry, Tom, Tom's going to put in a good word for you. Okay, All he'll right, make sure he'll, he'll, he'll make sure, sure it happens. Uh, when you left PEI, and I know because my wife's from Newfoundland, and I remember when she moved to Ontario from Newfoundland, it was very hard for her to get used to not waking up and seeing the ocean and just being on an island and having that lifestyle. How difficult was that for you to like, and do you miss, how much do you miss PEI? Oh yeah, man, I miss it. I miss it like crazy. Um, especially the summers, uh, PEI summers are unmatched. They're, they're amazing. Um, so last summer, 2020, um, with, with the minor league season being canceled, I got to spend, um, all summer, uh, back home. And it, it was great. You know, it wasn't, you know, a normal summer with restrictions and everything like that, but it was still great to, you know, just wake up and go for a run on the beach or, you know, go fishing or whatever. Right. It was just, 
How's your golf game? You still playing? It got better. It got nice. Better. It got better. <laughs> um, it was a summer where I actually got to golf quite a bit. Um, you know, like a summer like this where we have one off day a week. It's not something that I get to do as much as I'd like to. Um, but yeah, the golf game definitely improved last summer. Still not where I'd like it to be, but you know, we'll take it step by step. Tom, don't you picture Cole being like, remember Happy Gilmore, who was a hockey player? I picture Cole like starting his golf swing, swing from a squat position and kind of just working his way as if he's throwing to second base and kind of, but in all honesty, I mean, there, there are so many, you know, techniques and things that your body's used to. So when you're used to squatting as often as you are, how much does that throw your body off if you start playing golf on a regular basis or is it easy to adapt back and forth? It's fairly easy to adapt. Um, you know, I'm one of, I'm one of those guys where, you know, switching from a baseball swing to a golf swing. Um, it doesn't mess anything up with me in terms of timing or rhythm. Um, so yeah, it's, I make the transition pretty easily. It doesn't, it doesn't mess with me at all. See, I, I took up golf after I stopped playing baseball for years and now when I go back and play baseball, my baseball swing's absolutely destroyed. But oh, yeah. coming into you know, oh bad, bad it's it's awful. And you know, yeah, coming it into twenty twenty good. It was never really good. I will I will have you know my coaches used to say my swing reminded them of John Olrood. No way. At mm -hmm. the age at when yeah, but John Olerud at the age of fifty. Not yeah, John yeah, Olerud today. <laughs> Not John but, Olerud of the Blue Jay years. No, no, and it's and it's and it's no, but it's awful now. So like, I, I'm not even bragging about myself. Like, I, I go out with my kid, and he just he he killed me the other day. He pitched to me for the first time, yeah. and I couldn't touch it. He's got he's got this nice little dip on his two seamer. I couldn't get anywhere near it. No but, way. Yeah, but you know, sorry to get back to to kind of more of the baseball thing. Um, 2020 was a difficult year. I mean, obviously, spending a lot of time playing golf. How was it coming back in 2021? Was it was it the same this year as any other year, or was it a much more difficult season to get into? Um, I think it was a little bit more difficult for me in particular, just because um, I couldn't get down to the states um, any earlier to you know work out with with friends that were going to spring training as well um, I kind of had to um work with what I was given in in PEI um so it get into spring training it was a little bit of a challenge to get back into the rhythm and seeing that caliber of pitching and, and you know catching that caliber of pitching um but you know once you know your your, your two three weeks are, are in for spring training and you're ready to break camp um, you know, you're, you're at that point, you're, you're pretty ready to, to start playing games and uh, you're getting eager. Right. So it was, uh, you know, it was a, a little bit of a harder, um, transition this year in 2021, but you know, we, we made it work. Absolutely. You made it work. Okay. One last question. Growing up, were you a Blue Jays fan? You can come. I clean. sure was. Okay. Thank God. I was. Okay. <laughs> favorite, <laughs> but, favorite player? Favorite player. You know, I always, I always loved the Blue Jays catchers. You know, it doesn't, it didn't really matter who it was, whoever was catching at the time. I was kind of a fan, like Rod Barajas or Molina or JP and CB. It really didn't matter for me. Um, and then Vernon Wells was always one of my favorite players growing up too. Um, nice. Yeah, I was, yeah, either either one of those dudes was, were were awesome to watch. They were so fun. You know, we've had a, a crap load of former Blue Jay catchers on this show, and one thing they all share is that when they decided to become a catcher, they knew that there was something a little bit disconnected up here because to, <laughs> to do what – and I, growing up, I wanted to be a goalie, and everybody said, what are you, nuts? You're going to stand and have people fire these hard things at your body? And, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, are, are have there been times where you've been squat down for a long time and you've taken another foul ball off your inside of the kneecap and you're thinking, why the hell am I a catcher? Yeah, I uh, contemplate that decision every <laughs> almost every other day. Um, you know, it's a tough position on the body, but you know, I can't picture myself playing anywhere else. Um, I just feel like I'd be 
all bent out of shape if I was thrown at first base or out the outfield or something like that. I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Um, yeah, I uh, kind of don't know why I wanted to be a catcher. Yeah, ever <laughs> since T-ball, I, when there was no, not even a catcher on the field, I wanted to put on gear and be a catcher. I don't know why, but that's just the way it's always been. Well, if it weren't for the fact I was left-handed, I probably would have wanted to pursue that as well. It works as a goalie, but but definitely not as a catcher. So, well, listen, uh, this was a blast. Uh, okay, I'm going to be – I was planning to head to PEI uh, last summer, but then the COVID stuff happened. Gotcha. My wife and I want to go and meet her family who are going to come from Newfoundland. So if there's sure. one place that we have to see when we're in PEI, what is it? One place – other than your pl- your house, house, of course. Yeah, other than, other than my head. Um, let's see. I would say you got to check out just one of the lobster suppers. Um, you know, in New Glasgow, they have really good lobster supper um, right by the water, um, if that's what you guys are into. Um, if you guys are into kind of the downtown scene, I would check out uh, Victoria Row. Uh, there's a really good strip of uh, restaurants and, and bars. Um, it's awesome in the summertime it's it all gets lit up and there's live music um, and then i would um just check out all the beaches and stuff like that you know get get to the water go to some lighthouses um those are really cool really cool to see a lot of history well you had you had us at music right yeah as you can see behind us tom and i are also musicians so you work on getting us a gig out there for for our band and and you know we'll put in a good word to the tigers for you okay yeah, well, my, my dad's actually been a, a gigging musician on, in PEI for, for the last four, 30, 30 years. So, oh, wow. Um, if you guys ever make it out there and see uh, the band, the boys in the kitchen, be sure to check them out. They, That's play, awesome. at the old, they play at the old Dublin pub. And so, if you, are you music at all? Do you play any instruments? I do. I, I, play, I play the guitar as well. And oh, I do nice. some. A little bit of live gigging myself whenever I go home with my uh, buddy Nolan Compton. So nice. you can you can check him out. He's a very very good singer. Young my age, um, sings a lot of country and, and rock and and some Celtic stuff too. So me and him get together whenever I, I get home in the off season. We do a little bit of gigging. So why didn't we start with that, Tom? I don't Holy know. Yeah. Okay, if I'd have known. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we know. I, I seen I seen the guitars in, in both your guys' backgrounds. It's like, yeah. dang, these guys are, are musicians too. Oh yeah. Tom and I have uh, got a couple of bands that we're in together and uh, uh nice. you know, yeah, we do music all the time. So we are you know it's funny because I think every musician dreams of being a pro athlete and every pro athlete dreams of being <laughs> a, a professional musician. There's always That's been this right. connection between sports and music and uh that's really cool. So, all right. Well, we'll, we'll have to check out your dad uh, when we come out to PEI to play. We can open. We'll open for your dad. How about that? There you go. Yeah, there we there, go. That, that's perfect. And, and if, if you're, you're ever looking for guitar, guitar lessons, lessons, Tom is like the best teacher on the planet, planet and he does it uh, remotely, too. So, perfect. There yeah, you go. I offer it right there for you, Tom. There we go. I, I offer it free to, to all Blue Jays players and prospects. I think I can extend it to Detroit for a Canadian boy. Perfect. Sounds good. Awesome. Cole, man, listen, uh, what a pleasure meeting you. Uh, All the best as you make your your way through the system. And can't wait to see you in the majors. And when you make it to the big leagues, promise me this. Don't don't big league us. Remember us and say, I want to come back on this guy's show. For sure. Foundation Physiotherapy presents The Medical Room. There he is, our good pal, Raj Safaya from Foundation Physiotherapy. Always great to see your positivity each and every week. Are we doing this now? Is this what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> Raj and I are Barry. You're not allowed to yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You're too old, Barry. You're too old. I, I've been told that about many Do the, the, the This, this, this one from the, from the 60s or the 50s when, when you were a kid. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> The Blue Jays have made some trades over the last little while, and one of the ones that was very curious for many was that a deal that included Corey Dickerson coming to the Blue Jays. Now, Corey Dickerson's a fantastic ball player. He's had a great pass, but he comes to the team already injured, and the injury that they're telling us, Raj, is a foot contusion. Now, if I was to put that in layman's terms, I'd say he's got a bruise, he's got a boo-boo on his foot. Why would something like this be an injury that would cause a baseball player to not play? 
Well, actually, um, you know, it, it is a contusion, but contusions are, are different based on the bones that are affected, right? So the foot, if you think about it, um, is actually made up of all these small little bones. Uh, so there's smaller bones. There's a lot of blood vessels in the feet as well, right? Because uh, the feet are like, you know, that's why we're more ticklish, let's say, in our feet than maybe like our, you know, shoulder or something like that. Uh, it's just because of the amount of blood vessels, not a lot of muscle structure around it. So it's not the most protected structure. Uh, so a bone bruise can be more significant given that the density of the bones are thinner and that there's just more smaller bones in the area. So, and it, there's more exposed blood vessels as, as well. So, you know, it is a, I would say, even though, yes, it's just a contusion because it's the foot, it's likely going to be a little bit longer of a recovery. Um, and then obviously for an athlete, uh, you need your foot. You, 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 you know, that's how else are you going to train? What else are you going to do? You can't really be off your foot. Uh, you know, so you, you, there is going to be an expected longer recovery time, given that it's an injury to the foot. You know, it's something that a lot of people don't understand about bases in baseball. I played, you know, I played fast pitch growing up here in Canada. I know lots of people who play baseball. My son plays baseball. I've coached baseball. But it wasn't until I stepped onto a major league field a couple of years ago during a Blue Jays event that I realized these are tiny little granite death rocks <laughs> that are out in the field. And Can't use that as an excuse, Tom. They haven't played there in two and a half years. Well, yeah, but no matter where you are in the major leagues, they're like, hey, how you doing? Let's dive into this pillar, this tiny short pillar. And and in this particular, this is this poor guy. And I've got two questions about the injury, but we'll get to those later. What I want to know is, you know, that massive amount of speed run into that base, that stomp down in cleats on a yeah. hard, sharp surface. How many injuries a year, Barry, do we hear about? Raj, how bad an impact does that have just that jamming down onto that sharp hard surface cumulatively for these players of course i mean uh, like you're they're doing movements that most of us don't normally do right and they're doing it at speeds and at power that we don't normally do even less like the, 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 the that it's going from that fast run to that quick sudden stop and then that take off again right there's a lot of power that's driven through their foot um and so you can imagine the amount of energy that's in the foot and then you have that energy with some sort of impact on it, uh, whether it's another player stepping on it or, or some other injury, you're, you're bound to get like a larger type of injury to that area or a more severe injury, just given, given the amount of force that's happening through that area. So for sure, like it's going to be, and that's why I think the recovery is going to be longer as well, because they need the foot to be so involved. It's not just, let's just go back for a walk. Let's just do a sprint. Let's go for a run. You know, you need to be able to power off the foot quickly. Uh, you know, for the most part, you almost treat baseball players like sprinters at a bit, right? They have to sprint. So there's a lot of power that's driven from the Achilles in the foot in order to do that movement. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I have quite a bit of experience running the bases myself at two years of fantasy camp. You made contact? Base running's terrible. Oh my gosh, it's taking two days to get to first. Took about seven seconds to get down the line. And not once did I ever have any issues running. Well, I mean, if anyone saw me run, they realized that the speed that I was running at was very slow. So that probably has something to do with it, right? So what I'm getting at is that anybody that's my age that's playing beer league baseball, there probably isn't the same danger of doing that. 100%. And you're because you're, you're also not, your force consumption, your force is not as much as that of a player's, right? Um, it's know, close, got, <laughs> close, close. It's just about five percent <laughs> off, right? Just about five percent off, right? Um, and obviously, there's so much more contact in the professional league because there's more, there's more at stake. For us, we both know both teams are going out and have a drink after, so it's fine. <laughs> right? But there's way more at stake in the professional league, so you know, the more stakes is more risk. So I said I had two questions about this injury. The first question I have is. And, and it's one that I always bring up and you can probably answer pretty quickly is, is a contusion or, or, or essentially a bruise like this. Is it something that can lead to other problems down the road for this guy? I, I that's a good question. Unlike like muscular strains and sprains, I don't think so. Um, you know, he'll, he'll recover. He's going to have a period of rest. That's why he's in a walking boot. Uh, Cause he needs to be off the foot, but he still needs to be able to walk. So they put him out of these air cast boots so that it doesn't 
the weight on it. Um, he'll probably just going to do a lot of recovery work on it, let the inflammation calm down. Um, but likely because it wasn't muscle or ligament damage, he'll be, you know, he'll have that strength and power. It's just about letting the bones heal so that there's blood flow back into the area. And so my second question is, what is the worst bruise as a therapist you've ever seen? What's the worst bruise? I mean, I, I think, uh, you, you know, where I think the three biggest areas for, you know, simply like bruising is going to be in the foot, in the hand, and in the face. Um, you know, and it's essentially looking at areas that have a lot of high blood flow, right? Uh, the more sensitive the area, the more like nerves that are in the area, that's likely where the bruise is going to affect us more. I mean, I've seen some nasty bruises, but I would say the more painful ones are probably having in those areas, like the, the hand, the foot, and the face. Admit it, Raj. When Tom's foot was at its worst, if he came to see you and he said, what do you think of this? You'd probably go, oh, God, no. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm a professional. I might just do it after. All right. Uh, guys, I'd love to stay and chat a lot longer, but we have to run. And thankfully, all of us can. Well, oh, two of us can. Sad. Raj, Is take that care. Is bruise on your face, Barry? Oh, no, that's <laughs> just your face. Sadly, <laughs> there's no recovery time for that. Yeah, this is all going to be sorry, edited man. out. Now, now that we have, a, now that we because, have banter, I need to go. Because there, there always is danger that this could get a lot worse too, Raj. Yeah, so. you're right. <laughs> Thank goodness we can edit it out. Next week, Raj, we'll talk to you. Tossed over this. Yeah, yeah, and he should because he's got to stick up for his pitcher. He's got to stick up for his first baseman. This could be two games in a row. But. They call Bobble. A pitch that certainly appeared to be outside. Again, a bit of a late call, and now John Gibbons gets tossed out. Keith Allison into the game. You know what? And I think if you're Jim Wolf, you've got to take this. you got to take it. Gibby's protecting his players. you got to just take it. You don't throw him out of the ball game. Well, he is back again for another round. Former Toronto Blue Jays manager, John Gib Gibby, are you still you still scouting? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so was this was this your first draft as a scout? Well, you know, well, you know, well, last year they had like a, a real. Uh, had they, how many rounds did they do last year? It was kind of a. Anyway, last year I, I went out for about a month, and then uh, COVID hit. They yanked everybody off the road. And I was traveling around the country, you know, some spots, look at some of the better players that they, they, they like, the Braves like. And then, of course, then, then they hit and they, that was done. And then this year, you know, I, I saw probably about five or six guys a couple times each. But that's been kind of the, the limit of it, you know. Um, but, you know, and it's uh, it's good to see good to see some baseball. Things, you know, around here, I don't know necessarily know how everything is up there. I mean, you would never know that, you know, that, there's still that you know COVID's still around and whatever. I mean, in te Texas is functioning pretty, pretty normally, you know. And in, uh, but there's still limitations. I know different organizations, you know, are still monitor, you know, are still cutting or holding or cutting back some certain areas. So, but yeah, it was if they had the draft the other day. I don't think any of my guys got drafted. But <laughs> do you know of the players that the Braves took? Are, is there anyone that looks particularly exciting? You know, I, I don't know. You know, that's that's the thing. They they sent me they sent me out to look at about five or six different guys. And when I say that, that the Rays didn't take them, but there, you know, there's a Detroit took a couple of them. And uh, uh, so, but the other guys, the guys the Braves took, Braves took. No, I didn't see any of those. That's the thing. You know, they're they're, they're top scouts and everything like that. You know, are the Braves top scouts? You know, they go and see everybody even through all this. So, so they're the guys that have, you know, they know what they're comparing everything to. So, so John, I'm not sure if you know, but Barry's been uh, doing car sales for Honda and like with a car salesman, thank if he you goes very much couple... for the plug. Absolutely. I might buy a car You're... from if he sold Ford. Oh, it's, it, it's Honda. Sorry. But, uh, or, or if you he know... lived in Ontario. Yeah. But when Barry goes to work, if he, if he goes to work a couple of weeks and he doesn't sell a car, he starts hearing it from his boss, right? So as a scout, are you getting phone calls? Like, did you get a phone call after the draft and go, Gibby, like, we didn't take a single one of your guys. You got to gotta send us better guys for next year. Well, yeah, well I, you know, I, I, yeah, no, but I would tell him, 
well, three or four or five years from now when these guys make it or, or they don't make it, you, well, you, should, you, you probably figure out you should have listened to me. <laughs> <laughs> So See, there's, always, there's always that little time frame, you know, you got a little buffer in this sport when it comes to you know, the, the young kids. Well, speaking of young kids, Gibby, uh, a lot of those young kids that you saw uh, in 2015, 2016, 2017 are now all stars. I mean, you and I both saw Vladdy when he was first signed by, by the Blue Jays and he was just a 16 year old kid hitting bombs. You know, we saw, you know, the development of Bo Bichette. How nice is it to see what's happening with these kids right now? Yeah, you know, Barry, you know what? The, yeah, it's number one. They're they're all very talented, you know, and they're and they're really it's all it's all starting to come together for them. But you know, the, the, what a couple of those you mentioned right there, you know, they're good guys. Too. You know what? You know the guys you like being around, the guys you you pull forward, and uh, you know, I saw that home run Blatty hit the other night, and you know, I got. Uh, I got asked a couple of times over the last couple of years, you know, I think some people were complaining or, or not necessarily complaining, but they were wondering what's wrong with Vladdy is he's not going to be this, that in, in the, and, and my comment was always, you know what, you leave the kid alone. You know, everybody, everybody in, in baseball thinks this kid, we got this kid's a real deal. That doesn't happen too often. And not, and there's too many good, smart baseball people out there to be wrong. Right. But it takes, but it does take a little time. I see, but, but where I think you run into trouble now, the kid maybe struggle a little bit uh, just because it's the big leagues and they, you know, they have all the info on him. They might pitch him a certain way or and he's got to make adjustments. But sometimes then we start start to overcoach think because our title is a coach. You got to coach. No, sometimes those, those really good ones just get the hell out of the way. Understand that you're in a rebuilding mode and just let him go play. Make sure he's in the lineup every stinking day and throw him out there. You know what? And the really good ones like this kid, they'll figure it out. Now, you, you know, you do your drills. I mean, they all have little things they do to make, you know, their swing right and all that. And they, they know that. And then the coaches know that. Do those stuff and, you know what, get the hell out of the way, man, because uh, all we can really do is screw them up, guys like that, you know. And then, of course, Bo, Bo's really, you know, you got oh, good bloodlines, you know. But they got a good, young, talented team. You know, you still, but you still got a pitch. You still got to catch it. I can remember in uh, – and I couldn't even tell you how they're doing as far as that goes, but I can remember in 15, remember the teams we had – we could hit with anybody, but we couldn't catch it. We had the Calabello and Valencia playing left field, and we had guys all out of position. And Reyes was playing shortstop. The balls, balls were trickling through. So we had outscore you most nights, but we were still a 500 team because we didn't play defense. And then, of course, you know, the big trade deadline and Tulowitzki really short up the infield and Ben Revere out there, and it made all the difference in the world. So, yeah, but they got a good young team. They in uh, they surrounded with the right kind of guys like they're trying to do. Um you know, this should be good for a while. And yet it's so interesting that these young players are tearing it up. The Jays offense is, is just phenomenal. Yet fans, many fans still cannot go a day without saying that Charlie Montoyo is the worst manager in Blue Jays history, which is good because that means it's no longer you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's new, though? Yeah, they, 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 they suck on that, uh, yeah. Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but can you, you remember for that? Oh, yeah, I do remember that well. Can you for a minute, though, kind of feel for what Charlie's going through? Because as a manager, if the team wins 10 in a row, it has nothing to do with you. And if there's one pitching change that happens that does not work out, it's all of a sudden on the manager. And, and it's amazing that it doesn't matter where the team is in the standings, what talent is there, the manager gets it so much. Like, Is this something that... Of all the things about being a manager, this is the thing that you probably miss the least is the fact that you get blamed for everything. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You know, but getting, you know, Barry going in, you, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, it, uh, uh, I will say though, my time in Toronto, I found out that the, fan, the fans love the players, man. You know, they was kind of, they were, a lot of the players were hand, it was hands off, you know, they could do no wrong. And naturally it's always been that, you know, they, they go after the, uh, you know, they go after the manager or the, or the front office, you know, that's just kind of, you know, that's kind of the way it works. So, you know, if you can't handle and take that, you know, you're in trouble, but yeah, there was many times I wanted, you know, I wanted to, you know, stick it to somebody if I could have, but I couldn't, you know, and it's like, you know, Hey, wake up, pay attention, you know, uh, go beat on somebody else for a while. But you know what, that's when you get frustrated and, uh, you know, but that's, uh, you know, your job really as a manager, you gotta, you gotta take the heat, the bullets for the guys and, um, 
you know, get out of the way when things are going good. And that's, uh, you know, if you, because in reality, if, if, if all you worry about is getting the accolades and the team real good and say, well, this is Gibbons, this is Montoya, this is whoever's uh, Tosca's, they're the key to this thing. You know, if that's what you're looking for, you know, it's, you, you ain't going to hang around long anyway. And, and, and it's, mm-hmm. and, and baseball is so different. A lot of sports is, I've always said this is not necessarily X's and O's, like say football or something, right? It's really getting the guys to play. They're out there every day, getting the most out of running the pitching staff. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not, I mean, we've kind of tried to turn it into rocket science, but it's still really not rocket science. And uh, sometimes your best, hey, get them, get them in the right frame of mind, get, make sure they're ready to play, throw them out there every night and get, get, get the hell out of the way sometimes because, you know, like it, it's always been in the sport of baseball when you play 162 games or how many is the best teams win. And there might be a little aberration. You know, you might get a couple teams that overachieve in a particular year. You might get a couple teams that underachieve. But everybody finds their level, and it's how the best teams win. That's, there's no secret about that. One of the, I guess, criticisms of your time in Toronto, and I think it was pretty unfounded. What? what? Yep. Criticisms of Gibby? There were, I know. But it, it's, it's, it's ironic because one of the things that you got knocked for occasionally was a lack of, of reliance on the numbers, right? And a focus on the fundamentals and the intangibles. And now we're here with poor Montoyo, and one of the things that he really gets knocked out <laughs> is taking pitchers out too early because he's going by the numbers. So you know, does there, is there a sweet spot that, that every manager has to try and hit? Or is there, like, is there like a far end of the spectrum where you can just run your game from the office by the numbers and you don't ever actually have to make a decision? Yeah. Oh yeah. You can do that. I think that's kind of the way they, they, they want to do it nowadays. They want, you know, the front office would be glad to make some, you know, the decisions for you. And eventually there's, I'm sure there'll be a, uh, an analytics guy be named manager. You know, that's kind of, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I can't, you know, I think I got a bum rap that I was anti analytics, which is, which is so untrue. No, I didn't get carried away like some guys did, and, and uh, they gave me the flexibility to to run it the way I, I felt necessary. You know, I felt I, I felt the best about, it. and then you know, of course, then you know, which is good about that is I, I live with the results. You know, and I'm held accountable for the results. But but we were doing analytics, kind of analytics. Well, baseball to begin with. Baseball's always been numbers. Every every they can say what they want. Every manager has been looking at numbers from day one. That's how you form lineups. That's how you, you know. That's how we acquire. But, you know, maybe you're looking at the number a little bit differently, but it's just such a stat or any game. It always will. You know, you look at all the record books and all that. But, but analytics, we were doing some of that back in the early 2000s before some, you know, before it became like the thing, you know, like Moneyball and all that. Yeah, we played Troy Gloss at shortstop and we had a, uh, a few times when we had a fly ball pitcher on the mound, right? You know, that was before anybody was doing it. So we obviously we weren't so uh, too anti, you know, uh, we had, had we hit Batista the leadoff spot, you know, the, premier home run hitters in the game that's kind of unusual you know and we, we did some, we did some things in, in the so you know i don't buy that it's, uh but i will say this i do i you know, and i'll go to my grave with this you know you should you these guys aren't robots you know you're, de- you're dealing with the human element you know and on any given night you know that guy may be on if he's a pitcher he may be on he may be having the game of his life you know what so if the numbers tell you you're supposed to yank him here it's a big, big mistake because this is this is his night, you know. And you got to, you know, just got to be able to recognize that, right? Or you know, the, the same way with a hitter, he may be having a huge night. You know, maybe a guy that you normally platoon or you pin, you might pinch it for. No, this might be his night. So, so many things dictate. And then going back to the pitcher, pitcher, sometimes you got to let those guys pitch because you know what? If they ain't pitching, who's pitching? The bullpen. They end up killing those guys, and then as the season wears on, they're 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 done. Now you don't have anybody else to fill their spots, and you know what? The, the season. Uh, implodes in the well, okay. Maybe I should let the guy start to throw a little bit more, you know, because he wasn't too bad. You know, we had uh Wardo on last week, and and Dwayne was saying that you know, we're come to a point now where pitch there's not going to be starting pitchers and relief pitchers, there's just going to be pitchers, and guys are going to be paid by the performance. Because why should a guy get 20 million dollars to pitch four innings a start, right? And it's really changed. and you know, when you see a starter out there and he's cruising along, it kills me inside when I see the manager go pull him from a game simply because, okay, it's the third time he's seen the order. Well, the guy, like, 
when when you were managing, how much did you use the eye test? I mean, I remember Jack Morris saying, the manager knows when I'm done. He can tell by looking at me. He doesn't need to look at analytics. Was that how you kind of looked at Did you do a lot of that gut feeling and just knowing? Like, Burley's looking great. Why am I taking him out because he's throwing 100 pitches? Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> You know, some of it, so much of it's common sense, you know. I mean, I, yeah, you know, the big, one of the big numbers like you talk about now is the third time through the lineup. Well, you know, you kind of – you always kind of knew that. I mean, you could, you, could, you could always tell, I mean, whether you had the actual number or not. You knew if he – especially if he's not like – you know, if you're your top dogs, they don't quite struggle the third time through, like the average Joe, right, or the less than average. Okay, so you kind of know that. That's, that's who these guys are. You know, they get up to a certain number of pitches or in that, whatever that range is, they run out of gas, they run out of steam, you know, and that's kind of, maybe they're not physically as strong or their stuff, stuff's just not as good. That's just, fat. you know, so it's going to drop off and, and uh, they're vulnerable. I mean, you can see that you don't need to look at a computer to tell you that. And no. there's going to be a night where a guy who normally, you know, can't face the order the third time through is just cruising. And as a manager, you've got to make that decision, right? Not based on what the books say, but what your eyes are telling you. Right. I mean, if the guy's getting the guy out, then let him go, you know, because, you know, it, like all of us have been around baseball so long. I mean, you, 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 you know that there's certain nights, it's just your night, you know, in, in the, it's like, or like, a, even like a hitter gets on the, gets on those rolls, you know, the hitting streaks or whatever, they're just rolling. And you ask them, what's going on? First of all, they don't want to tell you to curse it, but they don't know. It's just you know what you get, things just sometimes happen that way in baseball. Good, good uh, uh, momentum rolls start happening just like the bat. bat the, they, they happen that way. The bad side too. Same way with the pitcher, you know, like Earl Hershiser when he said that you know the uh, scoreless inning streak type thing. You know what? Okay, is he that good? Probably not. I mean, because how many guys have done that? But you know what? I mean, things things broke his way. You know, I mean, things things just happen for whatever reason. He's good. He was top, one of the top of the game, but everything just fell in place. And you're thinking, okay, why is that? Nobody knows. It's just you know, some things happen. So 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 when things are going good, sometimes you got to roll with it, man. And, and, and what I think happens is the baseball guys maybe start screwing around like that and get too smart. And the baseball guys punish you. But I will say one thing too. And I saw it happen a few times to me personally, and I saw it on the other side. When you get a let's talk about a pitcher. When you got a pitcher out there and he's he's rolling, he's cruising. He, he be, okay, he's getting up there in pitches. He might be a little fatigued, but he's still pretty good, right? And he's and he's getting guys out, and it's getting later in the game. And yeah, you run through your mind. It's this. If something happens, and and we got to take him out. You so you're prepared. But you take this guy, you know, all of a sudden you just take him out because you think, well, maybe he looks tired or maybe the analytics say, well, you know, third, fourth, whatever, whatever it is, I have to take him out. You go out there and it's almost like you can look in the other dugout and it's like, it's like you can, almost, you can, you can they're, they're saying, oh yeah, and they're saying, thank you very much. So I'm going to say, hey, asshole, thank you very much. <laughs> and then what happens? And now it flips. It's like the baseball guys hurt him. Now it flips. And now they, I don't care how good the guy you bring in. You know, these guys can now they can relax and say, thanks, God. He, n- nice move, Skip. You brought this guy in. Now, now the other team, they just go boom. They, they, they explode for whatever reason. You see that happen. I mean, and, uh, so sometimes you do, you do that other team a favor when you think you're actually trying to do your team a favor. Did you think you would ever live through a time when a pitcher would be pulled from a game while throwing a no-hitter and is not injured? No, I know, I know. Come on, you, you can't, you can't mess, you can't see, you can't mess with. Like I said again, the baseball gods, baseball history. I, you know what? I ain't got enough guts to do that. You know, I, you know what? Because the, these guys, you know, they they, they want to throw no hitter, right? The fans want to see it. Historically, it's a it's a big deal. So, um, you know, enough. This guy's got a, a long injury history. You know, maybe you might, at least you might, you're going to think about it. Well, gosh, gosh, I don't want to see this guy here get hurt. But that's rare. I mean, that doesn't happen. I know this had some guys with blisters and things like that. Put it this way. I'd have a hard time taking a guy out, you know, and I'd be very shocked and I'd be very, very disappointed if the guy wanted to come out. We'll put it that way. But the game's kind of the, the thinking on both sides, uh, the coaching and front office side, as well as the players, has definitely changed. 
it seems like we're getting drawn into that, into this like specialty pitching, specialty roles. They 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 implemented a rule this year, you know, no more one batter pitchers, and and that seemed to kind of to ease things up a, a little bit, but we've definitely been trending towards shorter and shorter appearances. Is this something? in your opinion, that hopefully might cycle back in, in years ahead? like, Yeah, I, I hope so. You know, I mean, even when, even, you know, when I was there towards the end in, in the, you know, basically all your, your bullpen guys were turning into all one-inning guys. You know, even some of you'd ask, hey, you got we need you to give us a couple more outs. Or, and they can't do it, you know. So, that, so what they do is they just come in there and throw as hard as they can for an inning, right? That's all that they – then it becomes that's all that's expected of them. And that's really all physically they can do, I think. And that's why you get such a, the high radar gun readings because all they, they air it out, man, for whatever, you know, how many pitches they're going to throw, 20 pitches, 15, whatever. And um, so, yeah, it's 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 kind of – it's and it's not even a – I mean, it's just like, you know, they – Nothing adds up either. You know, the, you know, the commissioners and the baseball people, well, the games take too long. Okay. So what are we going to do? We can put in a replay and uh, where you, and you got, everybody's got 30, 45 seconds to review something before they even challenge or whatever. I thought we were worried about the length of games, you know, and then, uh, you know, just, just, the, just then all the pitching change because all these guys can, all they can do is, you know, okay, I get it. Th- three pitchers. I mean, you got to face three pitchers, but then, you know, I, I I never believe you don't don't mess with a game. You know, it's been a great game forever, right? You know, and if if you want, if you want, I think if you want to solve it, you know, you, when you're worried about that stuff like that, increase your roster size. You know what? Okay, for, what is it? 25, 20, Is it still twenty five? I don't even know. Twenty six. Bump it up to thirty. You know, now you can carry them extra guys, right? Now your bullpen doesn't get beat to hell because you know you got some other guys to throw, but they they're not going to do that because it costs too much money and salaries and all the other things. So it's Sometimes it's so much like we talk out both sides of our mouth in this business, you know, and then we, well, the games take too long. Well, okay. Then don't put in an instant replay or don't, you know, whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> so anyway, but I, yeah, I, I, I hope it cut, you know, it's, it's just, it's, yeah, nobody likes to see, you know, sometimes you do have to make pitch and change. You try to win a game. I mean, I mean, but, but if every night, if every, every you know, if every, if everything's dictated to you that hey, I got to change this, got to take this guy at a certain time, you know, okay. I, I, I was a little bit embarrassed sometimes at some of the, you know, the, some of the, some of the things I was listening to, you know, I love talking about all the rule changes in the game. There's one I need to ask you about. I'd love to know your opinion. Runner on second to start extra innings. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen a game though, where that's been implemented where we're actually, I've actually watched on TV where I've seen it, you know, an extra innings. Games that I've seen them like no extra, and I turn them off. I think because the games are too long, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, but it's like, yeah, come on. I mean, really, we don't mess with the game. The game, like I said a while ago, is, is pretty good. It's always been good. Just, just, just leave it alone. Now, now you're messing with statistics. You're messing with this, this, the history of the game, all that. It's like too. I said, don't you don't you don't need to change the slide rule at second base because somebody got clocked, right? You know what? It happens. You don't need to change the, the slide rule at home plate because somebody got hurt. You know what? Guys get hurt. Tell you if you don't like it, tell your catcher, don't block the plate. The other team, block the catcher, you don't care, block the plate, save the run. You know, and it's, it's like we, we uh, you know, we they start changing these things for, for what? You know what? The games, I don't think, I don't, I don't think there's such a long. There's so many guys getting uh, losing their careers because of severe injuries. I mean, that's happening that often where you need to change the whole game and, and things like that. You know, what the heck? Why don't you just, instead of starting a guy at second base, why don't you just flip a coin then? You know, you might flip a coin, and do everything, you know? <laughs> Gibby, I don't know if you were around, but the Blue Jays opened the season one year in Cleveland. And the first game, I want to say, went like 17 innings. And then the day after that there was another long like it was just two long days of baseball and that times like that are the times i say okay i'm fine with the guy starting at second base Although, oh, yeah. do you do you find like even as a, a manager i'm curious because as as a fan and as a media guy you don't want the game to go nine a 10 and then 11 it's like oh come on 12 but then once it gets to 13 14 15 then all of a sudden it's like Okay, this is cool. This is history. But I'm thinking as a manager, and you're throwing Ryan Goins out to pitch an inning, you're probably saying, yeah, this is not fun. 
No, no, yeah. You never want to have to do that. That's why I say increase your roster size. You don't fit in perfect in this day and age. Right? Yeah, you hate those. You know, that's kind of the beauty of baseball. You know, I mean, part of winning some things, you take a couple, you have two teams of similar talent that, that they're just, you know, basically just as good as each other. You know, sometimes the schedule, whether not, they might have had a little bit tougher schedule than a normal schedule. You know, they may play, they may have played extra, more extra inning games. They may have done that. And it takes a little bit of to- a toll on the team. More so than the other team, and that's just and then after 162 games, maybe that's what made the difference that helped this other team. That's just kind of the beauty of, of the sport, you know. I mean, just kind of deal with what, what's thrown at you. We don't, we don't have a stop. We don't have a clock, you know. And and uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's rough, especially when the weather's crap. And but what generally what happens when this game start going long, you know, from a manager or coach's standpoint is, you know what, you know, you, somebody's gonna have to get sent down. You know, you're gonna have to get some reinforcements in because you're gonna need some arms, you know. That's kind of what, what messes with you. And, um, you know, and if you got an older team, you know, the, the bodies, you know, they, they're going to be a little bit more banged up and it might might linger for an extra few days and that might affect you. So there's a lot of, a lot of things to weigh in, but that's just the game of baseball, man. Go out and play it, you know. And, and, uh, and you got, we're, we're all getting paid a lot of money to go do it, so what the hell. Yep. Gibby, uh, just before we bring in our studio audience, I'm I just curious to know, what you thought of uh, this past week, uh, Liam Hendricks, who, by the way, God, that dude is just on fire, and I'm really happy to see him doing as well as he's doing. And, uh, I mean, you, you managed him for a while as well. Uh, he had some pretty uh, venomous words to uh, t- about Josh Donaldson. And, you know, he never, it's, you know, he was pretty clear. He was, he's never been a fan of him personally, loves him as a player, but not personally. As a manager, first of all, are you ever aware of things like that going on in the clubhouse? And if you are, do you just stay out of it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, you're you're aware of most things, you know. Uh, somebody, Were you, you aware know, of this? Uh, no, I didn't know. I didn't. Even, I wouldn't even wear any, any of that. I didn't. Even, you know, but you know, Josh is kind of a mark man in the game. A lot of guys don't like Josh. You know, a lot a lot of reasons because Josh is really good and he beats you and things like that, and he, he's very vocal. You know. I didn't. I, I didn't know Liam said that. I, that shocks me that coming at Liam, but you know he's an all star now. I mean, so things. That, but he, and, and I tip my hat to him. He's, he's done a great job at turning really turning his career around. But uh, I, know, think, jo- I think I think Josh. Co- sorry, Gabby. I think Josh Donaldson calling out pitchers as cheaters probably has rubbed a lot of pitchers the wrong way. Anyway, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah that's kind of you know. That's kind of the what makes the game even a little more interesting and fun sometimes, you know, you get you guys battling out, popping off at each other. And, and it just kind of, it just kind of revs up the temperature a little bit, you know, and, uh, and, and it makes for good drama. You know, uh, it was when, uh, I remember when, when Josh came out and said something about Cole and then the Yankees were going to Minnesota to play and, and then he punched him out a couple, first couple times or whatever. Yeah. Josh might hit a home run late in the, or that, that series to win a game or tie a game in the ninth. But it's just kind of okay, you know. That's build up now. All right, he just, he just I tip my hat to Josh. You pop, he, you're gonna pop off when, when they're coming to town. You know that's the way you're gonna do it. That's the way you do it. Not not when you're not gonna see this team the rest of the year. So and then you know so it kind of creates a little drama, a little more extra excitement. You know everybody's focused on that. But you know when when there's tension in, in the conflict in your in your clubhouse, you know if it gets to the point or you're worried that you know it's gonna disrupt things or it's gonna you know, boil over and, you know, guys go, might throw some, go to fisticuffs or whatever. You got to do Shea, something about it. Shea Hillebrand. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, there you go. yeah, okay. But, you know, when, you know, when you're around each other every stinking day and these guys got such different personalities, you know, it's like being around your family every day. You know, you're going to get, you're going to get, there's going to be tension. You're going to get tired of some of the things somebody else is doing. And, and so much, too, depends on how the team's doing. The team's winning, playing good. You know, it, it's it's a great clubhouse. When when they, when the team's struggling, you stink. It's been a bad year. You know, uh, it's a, it, the clubhouse is out of control. The manager is not doing his job. It all depends on how the score is. But you have to be do get to keep a keep an eye on that kind of stuff, just to you know to keep things from getting out of control. Well, I but I will say that sometimes, you, hey, like we're talking about Josh, right? Sometimes your most volatile players are the best players in the game. You know, they wear it on their sleeve. They're emotional. That's what makes that's what makes them how they how good they are. It's like Batista. Jose, Jose, when I say Josh was probably the most disliked in the game, Jose was, you know, they were battling out for one and two. And for the same reason. You know, they both showed up to play. They're both great competitors. They're both best players in the game. 
but they would they were emotional you know they let they let you know it and they fight for themselves and they fight for their team and that, that did piss a lot of guys off but a lot of it was too because they were the some of the premier players in the game and, and naturally got a lot of guys don't like those guys but have you ever have you ever seen a player be able to turn that anger into home runs like Jose Bautista was because it seemed like you piss Jose off as the pitcher, he's going to hit a home run off you. And there are not very many players that can do that, Gibby. No, I know. Yeah. I, I, how many times did Jose do it? We got drilled or they throw a ball behind him. And you, yeah. yeah and, and, and sure enough, man, then he, 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 he take them suckers deeper. He do something and he goes, how does he do it? Cause that, that is, that is rare. You know, it's like, uh, uh, I don't know. It's some guys that they get ball thrown behind them or they get drilled. They get distracted or they get so angry they lose focus or whatever. It is. And not Hosey, man. He just, you know, and them suckers, man, they throw a pitch somehow and you get to it and burn them. And that's kind of the ultimate. Okay. Because there, there, was, there was a few times Hosey knew he probably was going to get hit or drilled or thrown at whatever. He knew it. So. Yeah. You know, he just he just kind of dealt with. It. He wasn't necessarily the guy that's going to go charge him out. He take hey, his he, take his medicine. You've been on this program many times before, but uh, we are now going to give you the opportunity to uh, to chat with your fans, Gibby. They still love you in Toronto. Okay, they still uh, love you in Toronto, and we're going to bring on some people here for you right now, and uh, they're going to uh, be able to chat with you. And let's go. So we've we've got Paul, we've got Fiona, and two faces that you remember very well, Sue and John. Ah, where is it? <laughs> well, why don't we, we'll leave you guys to the end, okay? Let's begin with uh, Fiona. And Fiona, let me get your audio going here. And uh, Fiona, is that from uh, what you call it? Shrek. Shrek. That's <laughs> a great name. I remember that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Fiona. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. My question's about uh, catching, actually. Um, as a former catcher, do you have any opinion on the guys who are going down on one knee to, uh, to catch? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, yeah, that used to be a no-no, you know. Was, well, I'll put it this way. If, if a guy was on base, you know, they would say, no, don't, don't do it. Because, you know what, uh, in case a guy steals a base, base starts running, you know, he, he, he can't get up off the ground. That was... That was always his thinking there, or uh, you know, some some guys with nobody on base, they get down on that knee because it may, you know they're they're that much closer to the ground if they need a block pitch. And let's say this pitcher throws a lot of you know uh, balls, you know low low pitches, and he gets a lot of bouncing balls, or uh, you know some or you, they you catchers would do it if they needed to uh, give the pitcher a lower target. You know, some guys are just big big body guys, and the only way they get down real low to get the target is get down on the knee but yeah i, I can uh, i don't ever remember, really ever remember seeing back when i was playing do that because the, the coach would say hey get up get what are we doing here you know if this guy runs what are you gonna be able to do? but i have seen that now and it's a it kind of it's I, I, and i always thought maybe well you know the game the, the the stealing bases and all that kind of stuff it's kind of really disappeared a lot in the game i don't know how much it's coming back if it all but so you know the kind of the if, if players aren't running, but you know, you also don't move as well in that position. So I would think more balls get by, but I got to believe it's, I don't think it's because they're necessarily they're tired, but I will say this quick, quick story before I don't want to drag this out too long. The first time when I, my first job in Toronto, I got, I hired, I was a bullpen catcher, right? This was 2002, was it? Yeah. And uh, not the bullpen coach, the bullpen catcher, like Anthopolis is now. So, uh, uh, no, Andropolis. What did I say? Anthopolis, he's down there. <laughs> he's my boss. <laughs> What's to say? They're both Greeks, man. You know? So, so he hires me in the, uh, JP Richard's GM hired me. So, so I took the job and I told him though, I said, listen, I had, I was, I hadn't played in 10 years. I hadn't been down to squatting position in 10 years. I don't think I could do it. He said, well, give it a try. So the first day in spring training, I go down there, you know, the bullpen catcher catches and helps these guys out in spring training. The first time I got down there to catch a pitcher, my knee blew up, you know, and it, it was like, swell. well, so the next down, the end of that day, I can't even walk, you know, and I'm thinking now I'm the only bullpen catcher in the game that can't catch and all the catchers are pissed at me and all that. So my point is, I said, I, I got to get the job done. So I go down on that one knee 
just so I maybe could get you should have gone down on two. You should have gone down on two knees. And exactly, exactly. But there was nobody on base, and I wasn't in a game, so I got away with it. You know. See, I have a fantastic idea, and I think this would be a great way to make catchers last much longer in the game and so much less pain. Give them a little stool. How about that? Imagine how long your career would have lasted, Gibby, had they given you like a little stool to sit on. Oh yeah, I, I heard Johnny Bench did that during, uh, during training in, bat, in batting practice. You know how catchers get back there; they hate to do it, but yeah. they got to catch live batting practice at the beginning of the spring. Yeah, they said Bench used to get there. Or maybe he was in the bullpen or both. Not during the games, but he, they put a little bench, a little little uh, stool down there. He'd sit on that sucker. Wow, Fiona, thank you so. Yes, uh, Fiona, thank you so much. And we're going to bring in uh, Paul now. And Paul, once we get you unmuted here, there you go, Paul. You are uh, you're up with John Gibbons. Perfect. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. Paul, oh, what's going on? Huh? Man, it looks like a beautiful day there. Now, where are you at? Are you right uh, Th- Thunder Bay, Ontario. So north, 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 northern Ontario. Up on top oh, okay. of the area. Yeah, still got some daylight. I'm okay. actually going to keep it. You must have got out of bed on the lake today, man. You got the yeah. air. <laughs> 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 got to run a comb through it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to cheat. I got two questions. One baseball and one Texas. So baseball, I'm interested to know what it was like trying to kind of manage the personalities in the dugout during that game five when the ball went off the bat. And then Texas, who has the best barbecue, and uh, where should I go? Oh, are you, are you coming down this way? Uh, eventually, yeah. Yeah, that's the plan. Go down and make a little yeah. trip. Yeah. Well, you know, as far as the, your, your first question there, you know, that whole team, it, it was, uh, yeah, big personalities, you know, in the, in the emotional guys. Um, and like I said earlier, that's what, that's what made them good. But they were also a handful. You know, you had some of the best players in the game, and so that's where there's egos, you know. Probably the two most vocal were uh, Donaldson and, and Batista, you know, and they and they they'd have fun together. But they butt heads in the in the uh, in the clubhouse before early before the game. And then uh, not in a bad way, but in Encarnacion used to have to go break it up, you know, and things and things like that. But they was just always you know just constant jawing at each other, you know. Um, but you know they. You know, of course, he had Strom, Strom, and you know, he started that game. You know, we had a lot of, you know, big personality guys in the in the. But you know what? For some reason, you know, when I well, at the beginning of that year when they when, uh, when they signed uh, Donaldson and Russell Martin, I think it brought some toughness to us. You know, it 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 because they were they were winning players in, in the. Uh, I think that's something we we needed. Uh, but then, then at the trade deadline, you know, when Price came in, you know, and then Tulowitzki, you know, Tulo's the ultimate the professional. But there was, for some reason, in it, and I think what was rare about that team, because a lot of times when you have that many personalities and, and big personalities, that many volatile type players, I was saying earlier, you know, how they were disliked in the league, you know, especially those two. That's the that's truth. So when you have a lot of those guys, it doesn't mesh, man, you know, because you, you got you got to, with us too big an ego here and they're fighting these guys and they want all the attention. And sometimes it's, you know, it goes, it, it's, it's tough to hold them together. This group, for some reason, it just gelled pretty good. And it started, like I said, with Josh and Russell at the beginning of the year. But then when you had a price too low, Ben Revere and some of those guys, it just something, just something good happened, you know, and they, they fit right in. And it was kind of a, uh, you know, a, a man, a big part of a manager's job, they can, you know, say all you want is, is hold your team together, putting out the fires, you know, get them to play every day. It's, it's not necessarily always who you bring in or do you take the pitcher out. You know, that's obviously that's very, very important. But sometimes behind the scenes, just, you know, getting to make sure these guys are focused and not fighting each other and fighting the other guys, you know. But I but I spent some time in the mid-80s with the Mets, who were probably the most renegade <laughs> team ever, right? You know, a great team, but, I mean, you talk about – but it was kind of the same thing. These guys, this, that, that group was a little more wild probably than the Blue Jays teams I'm talking about. I mean, and it was like no holds barred. But you know what? Come game time, man, they, I mean, they didn't, most of those guys did, a lot of those guys didn't like each other. They fought each other. They, but once that game started, before, you know what? They came together as a team, man. Nobody, I mean, they played to win. They played hard. And so that, that where that could have just, and I credit Davey Johnson for kind of, you know, kind of cultivating that and holding it together. He was managing the team, but it could have gone very easily the other way. It could have fractured because of this, you know, this asshole is, uh, you know, he wants all the attention over the strawberry, this, everybody, whatever, whatever, you know, but so it's kind of, it's, it can be kind of rare, you know, if, if you have too many superstars, you, can, you know, you figure you might, sometimes you, you should be better than sometimes there's, there's other things that are holding you back. 
Having said what Best you barbecue. Just said, oh. Oh, yes, the barbecue. <laughs> Come on. Can't forget the food, Gibby. All right. You know, I cheated. You know, I had to get it I, in I there. I grew up on this place called Bill Miller Barbecue. It's, but it's, it's like, it's, like a, it's a chain, right? Down, but down here in San Antonio. And it's like, you see, you see one every, every couple street corners. And uh, I just always loved that, you know? The, there's probably some, you know, there's probably some restaurants, you know, that strictly that, you know, just not franchises that, that are really, really good. But for some reason that, and, and they get the best iced tea. See, I go back, I went for the tea, <laughs> and, you know, and uh, yeah, so I would recommend that. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate Perfect. it. Hey, you're Thank welcome, you very much, man. Paul. <laughs> so following up on, on what Paul was saying there, uh, Gibby, I, I, if you were to do a, your resume today, what would you write down as your best attribute as a manager? What is the one aspect of managing that you'll probably say, I do that better than anything? Good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Tough question. You know, one you don't necessarily want to answer, you know, or I never really thought about it, or, or uh, you know, you, you let other people do the answer. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought, I thought I was pretty good at, uh, you know, uh, holding the clubhouse together and getting the guys to play. And, you know, I thought I thought I had a knack for the pitching, you know. You know, a big part of that, though, is, you know, the teams with the better pitching staffs and the, especially the better bullpens, you know what, the manager is smarter. He's going to make better moves. You know, even his bad moves, you come out a little bit better than maybe the guy that's got less. Now, that's no secret. You know, so I was fortunate to have some really good pitching staffs, but I was used to be a catcher, too, and I kind of prided myself in, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, watch what, you know, they watch what's going on in the game will tell you a lot, you know, and I, I could, and I would all, I, what else? I always leaned on the, the catcher on the team, whether it was Russell, even Zani back, you know, Zani in his day, all, all those guys, you know, and, and I'd, I'd get, I'd talk to him sometimes, just you get to mill the game, um, you know, as, how's, how's he looking? And what, is he losing it? Blah, blah, blah. And they were always pretty open with me, honest with me. Cause, you know, we, we can watch from the side in the, yeah, we get a pretty good idea of what's going on, but those guys are catching it head on and they can see maybe that ball is not quite moving as much and things like that. You know, Gibby, I, I, you literally buried the lead as far as your attributes, because what you glossed on just at the beginning, to me, I think that was a huge factor, especially when you recall about the number of big personalities in that clubhouse. S many managers would lose a clubhouse like that. I, I think we can all agree that, you know, you had an ability to keep a clubhouse together like no other manager we've seen in Toronto. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, it, uh, you know, what the thing is, too, I like these guys, you know, and I'd butt heads with them and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd laugh a joke in, in, uh, in rag, in rag with them and they'd drag me back. So it was, it was you know, uh, but they had the kind of personalities, uh, you know, that you could do that with. I've had some guys in the past and, you know, you do that and, you know, they're, you know you know, you know what I'm talking about. But so, so <laughs> that made it easier. We, you know, we had fun together. We, we, we really did. But, uh, you know, I think what you can't, what you can't happen, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, it's always been that way in baseball. You know, if you get, you get the superstar players, you can't be intimidated by them. Let them, let them run the show. You know, obviously you give them the respect for what they've earned, but you know, they're really no different than the other guy, other than some, some of the lesser players, other than they're, they're going to be in the lineup more than the other guy, you know? So he, I think you think, you know, it sends a good message, too, that, you know, you expect the same out of the, the top dog as you do out of the 25th guy on the run, right? Why wouldn't you, you know? And, and uh, so I, I think a big that's a big part of it, you know, that they know, hey, you know what? You know, this guy's got my back, too. He, if he's – so, if you know, if if you, if you don't back them up, they're, you know, they're not going to back you up. If you want – if you got to fight for them, if you want them to fight for you, you know, it's just kind of the way it works. And it was just a good group that I, I think I, I hit it off pretty good. But – you know, I've had some, I've, I had some, you know, blow ups in the past that, you know, but sometimes, you know what, it's like with your own kids, man. you know, sometimes, you know what, you can't, if you, you can't just go like this all the time. Sometimes it's got to be a little bump in the road, you know, to get somebody's attention, you know, this, Hey, you know, sometimes status quo isn't always good. Man, you know, and, and if I got to tell you something more than, uh, I'll be, I'll be liberal here more than three or four times. Something's probably wrong. You know, I, when I grew up, my dad, old man told me, he told me once that was, if I didn't do it, you know, that was probably, that was probably going to be some, a little hell to pay. You know, sometimes you get a little more flexibility, but sooner or later, come on, you know, and sooner or later, it's, it's probably your fault, not mine, because I asked you a number of times. If they don't, you know what, sometimes you got to get their attention somehow.
Is there one bump in the road with a player that you hit that sticks out in your mind is then watching that player after the confrontation turn it around and do the right thing? Oh, I know one. I know one. Kevin Pillar. I think you, Gibby, were really, really key on Kevin Pillar turning his career around. Well, I don't know about that. You know, I like, I like Kevin. That, that whole deal. You know what? I had heard about Kevin. You know, Kevin was drafted so late. You know, nobody expected him to do anything. Then he's the MVP on basically all his team, on all his teams in the minor leagues. And uh, one of my old roommates and best friend, Steve Springer, uh, who, who knew him and saw him play in the minor leagues, said, this kid can hit, this kid can hit, stick with him, blah, blah, blah. You know, but and actually he wasn't getting the recognition because he was such a low draft pick. But so he eventually works his way to the big leagues. And remember, we had Anthony Ghost, too, around that time. And, and Ghost had a ton of, as much talent as anybody. And he was trying to figure out his game. So the, the solution we had was, you know what, we're going we're gonna to platoon him. It was, I think we were at him. It might have been a month, two months left. Let's platoon him, see what happens. Give him some playing time. You know, best man wins or gives us a little better idea for next year. So they, and then we told him. They, they both knew that. And what happened with Kevin, Kevin wanted to hit. And they, they were bringing in a, a right-hander. And so naturally, hey, we're going to platoon him. We're going to let Ghost hit. But he wanted a chance to be, you know, to show us what he could do and, and drive in the runs and all. And that's one thing I love about Kev. You know, he 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 wanted to be the guy. You know, and, you know, I, hey, I tip my hat to the kid for that. But so anyway, so he he overreacted, slammed this. I mean, this guy, what's he got? A week, two weeks in the big leagues? I don't even remember what it was. I said, uh, you know, take your crap, go inside. You know, come see me after the game. Uh, and then, of course, we sent him down. We literally know we're probably going to have to send him down anyway, you know. But it looked better, the fact that, you know. And, uh, yeah, he didn't know that. <laughs> you know, and, and I love him to death, man, and he's the ultimate gamer. And Kev didn't say one word, and I called him in and said, basically said, you know what, I don't know what you're doing. You understand what, what we're having here, or what we're going to do with you and Gosey, blah, blah, blah. But you want to act, you know, you want to act like that, you ain't going that good. You know, go back down to AAA. You know, hopefully you come back, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you'll never get back, you know, unless you change your attitude a little bit like that. I, I love the enthusiasm. I love you I want to be the guy, but sure enough, he gets called back, but I don't know. I don't want any, hold any grudge just because I like the guy, you know, it was kind of the underdog in, in the, you know, we actually became, became really good friends. I guess, I think he would say it because I had the utmost respect for him, but I do. I, I think, I think that did him some good. You know, I, I really do. Well, he told us that he's been on our show and he said that, and, he said that once he got, you know, down, in fact, the entire drive down, he just spoke to his dad and he did a lot of soul searching. He did a lot of growing up. And these are key moments in players careers. Gibby, they, it's either a make or break. <laughs> Let's not forget what happened to Roy Halladay when he got sent down, not down to triple A, but he goes all the way back down to, to a ball. So, I mean, you really see like you always can tell a player's talents, but you really don't see what they have inside of them until you see how they deal with the adversities. Exactly. And then another one quick, you know, I, I had a little running with Teddy Lilly and Teddy, Teddy and I were good buddies, man. We used to run together on the road, you know, when, when, you know, like a day after a start or a couple, you know, we go, cause I used to, I used to, it was in somewhat better shape back then. So I jog a little bit at the ballpark. I think most of it, I, most of it during this time was right the, when I when I was I was a coach on the team. And of course, I became the manager when when this happened, and it was just an overreaction on my part a little bit, and, and obviously on his. He, you know, uh, because I really liked the guy. And then after it was over, you know, things settled down. You know what? Things is, things are as good as new. You know, I thought he was screwing around on the mound. You know, we gave him like a seven six seven run lead against Danny Heron when he was with Oakland. Heron was one of the better in the game. And he, and he goes out there. And, and uh, yeah, I think we dropped like four or five on him in the second inning. Anyway, and, it, and Teddy goes out there and, and uh, gets a couple strikes on somebody. Maybe walked the guy. Comes, and he throws a couple pitches sidearm. And I looked at the pitching coach. Well, well, what is that? He's never done that. That's, I thought he was screwing around or something. So anyway, now that thing's starting to snowball the other way. A couple of home runs, whatever. whatever. And then, so the pitching coach, Petey, goes out there. And uh, was it Pete? No, was it, was it Patterson at the end? Oh, was it Arn Arnsberg? Oh, was it? Yeah, Arnie. That's Arnie right. was Arnie. there. I was thinking. I was thinking because you know after I took Tosca's spot, uh, Pat Patterson was still there, and then then Pete came. Okay, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm glad. How can I forget Arnie, my man? But anyway, 
So he goes out there, you know, Artie's got away with words and Artie's a big drug. You know, uh, lay it on the line, don't mess with Artie time. And he basically felt, so anyway, next thing you know, he, he well, I think he was, he had like Eric Chavez, 0-2, right? And then he ends up dropping, throw another side on there, walks him. And so I, t- I go out there, take him out. That's what he doesn't give me, the, you know, the story. He doesn't give me the ball. And then we kind of jaw a little bit. Then he kind of sticks the ball in my gut. And that's it. That, that was it, man. I said, okay, anything but that, you know. And then, of course, and I'm walking off, and I see him down that little tunnel down the stairs. And I didn't give him much thought. I just kind of reacted. And I went down there, and I don't know if I said something to him first or he said something to me first. And then we just kind of hugged, I guess you could say. And then, they, and then the bench is cleared. And they come down and break it up. Nothing, nothing. Very, nothing really bad happened but Teddy you know that, that that's the thing that disappointed me the most is I, I really liked Teddy we had a good relationship and it was just emotions taking over but I said you know I'm thinking come on man we give you we don't score a lot of runs anyway we give you six or seven runs lead let's go I tell you what Gibby if, if we waited any longer to get to John and Sue I think they might go all Ted Lilly on us here so oh, without further ado uh, our favorite couple and for the first time, I think ever, John has longer hair than Sue. Yeah, yeah. it gets a cut. Hey. Uh, look at my Gibby jersey, but it's too, yeah. hot, too hot to wear it right now. But listen, I need to know when you're coming to Toronto because I have a gift for you, and it's a it's a maple oh. leaf with a five on it. Oh, so look at that! Hey, well, I don't know. Can I can, can we even come up there yet? Have they lifted the restrictions? You, when it's you yeah, you come up here, you qu- you quarantine at my house for 14 days, and then then you can go visit Sue. There you go. You know, I tell you what, I, I, I can't wait to get back up there. You know, right after, the year after I got fired, I, I, was, I, was, I came to Canada, I think it was, and I did like four different little banquets, right? Mm-hmm. I did a couple out there in the prairies, out in, in Moose Jaw, and then I did the, the one in Toronto, and then the, there was one on the East Coast. I think there was, well, there was four, maybe. And, uh, and I loved it. I said, hey, you know, I can get used to doing this. You know, I, you know, I guess I'll see a lot of old friends and enjoy it. It made a little money, naturally. And then when all this hits, you know, that kind of dried up. But I'm, I'm hoping maybe, you know what, unless, unless I'm totally forgotten, you know, when, when, when things kind of get back to normal, maybe there's another banquet or two I can come, come check it out and see some old friends, you know. We'll see you when it's safe, okay? Yeah, well, you guys stay safe. You guys look great. You look like you've I been out the, sun I love, you guys love been the I love the pictures behind you. The paintings are fabulous. You know, that's me on that horse. Did you re- realize that? No. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jordy, come here. <laughs> Jordan? Hey, Jordy, bring my family here. Come here, hurry up. Oh. Bring everybody. <laughs> I was gonna, how's, how's Jordan doing? Because you just, you just said, is that Sue? I Jordan. Hey, hey, I was like, is that Sue? How are you? Hey, John, are man, you look guys? at John. Look at long hair, John. He's like a hippie. Oh, I miss y'all. Damn. I recognize that voice from the living room. I was like, that's got to be And I had somebody I want you guys to meet. My, my new wife, Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, Hi Christy. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Hi, nice to meet you. So, and you, you know, taking good care like of her. Yeah. <laughs> you taking good care of our Gibby? <laughs> Hey, Sue was commenting on their wonderful that she loves the paintings on the wall back there. Oh, the Cowboys, yeah. yeah. I told her that was me, riding the range. I'm down, <laughs> yeah. there, I'm down there patrolling that border, man. You got to get the horse back. <laughs> <laughs> A good way to do it on horseback. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, uh, well, it's great to see you guys. Oh, it's so good to see you, too. Can't Are wait you... to see you again. Hey, hey show, them that, show them that shirt, Sue. You got oh, the... for me. Canada one, right? The Canada. Yeah, made it for me. Oh, I love that. Oh, well, that's so great. Hey, I hope it fits, man. I've been putting on a little weight since I retired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sue, uh, pass it over to your husband, John. Do you have a question for John? I I do, John. It's about managing, and uh, I have a lead in to my question. So when you Hi, <laughs> When you were with the Mets, you had Davey Johnson. And when you were uh, with the Royals, you had Trey Hillman. And then there was Carlos Tosca when you were uh, the bullpen catcher. So this gave you, and here's where the, where the props come in, John. Okay. Kingsport, 
Kingsport Mets, Appalachian League champions. St. Louis Mets, Florida State champions. Binghamton Mets, Eastern League playoffs. Norfolk Tides, International League playoffs. You come to the Jays and you have, you win 793 games. You pass some guy named Bobby Cox. I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, <laughs> but John, that's an incredible um, uh, yeah. resume and career of managing. So my question is, with the experience that you'd had in baseball, was there any one or two or three managers that really influenced you? Because it, from what we saw, you were really a player's manager and, yeah. and you really knew how to get a team, get the most out of a team. So with that experience, um, where did John Gibbons learn how to manage? Well, John, well, th well, thank you for some of those compliments there. Uh, well, you know, the only guy I, I, pl I played, you know, a little under two years in the big leagues, not a lot of playing time, but the only guy I ever put my manager was Davey Johnson. Davey's yeah. actually from San Antonio, my hometown. And I, and I love the guy. You know, he was very confident. Uh, he didn't necessarily talk a lot, but he showed confidence in his players. And, um, and he, he, I thought he was, a, he was a smart baseball guy, but it was just something I liked about it. it was, he was fair, you know, honest, that kind of guy. But he, but he was a player's manager. You know, he basically his rules were, you know, show up on time and play the game hard, right? You know, not too much to ask. And, and but he had the he had that wild bunch team, the mid eighty the Mets. So maybe they could have used a little more discipline. I don't know. But then, then the the, the two other men that that really influenced and helped me in the game. Uh, my first manager in rookie ball in Kingsport when I I got drafted in nineteen eighty was a man named Chuck Hiller, right? Chuck played with the Giants in the, you know, hit a hit Grand Slam in the World Series. But Chuck was always Whitey Herzog's right-hand man. So when, when they were, he would coach third base for him when he was in Kansas City. And then when Whitey was in St. Louis, you know, Chuck was his uh, third base coach. And Chuck would I, I always, I asked him one time, I said, you know, because, you, know, you know, Whitey was, you know, nobody better than Whitey. And uh, I said, well, how come Whitey takes you every, everywhere you go? He goes, he goes, every team needs an asshole. And I went, because he, because so, sorry, Sue. he said, so why did he didn't have to be the bad guy? Chuck would be the bad guy in the play. You know, Chuck would get on the players when why he needed something. And so, so why he never had to do it? I thought that's brilliant, you know? So, so anyway, so, but anyway, he was my first manager in rookie ball when I was a young kid, just left home and really helped me out a lot there. Then when I got into coaching again with the Mets, um, Back in the 90s, he was also still around as a uh, kind of an advisor. You know, he was just kind of semi-retired. And we became roommates during instruction and things like that. And uh, so he would talk. Now he's talking to me about coaching and stuff like that. And, it, I mean, it, I got so much from him. And then the last guy, Daryl Johnson, DJ, he managed the Red Sox, you know, in this 75 World Series against the Reds. And then he managed some of Seattle. When, uh, when I was – playing with the Mets my, towards the end of my career there in the, in the mid to late eighties, he was like the, the Mets general manager was a guy named Frank Cash. And he was a really good baseball guy and, you know, very successful. He ran, used to run the Baltimore Orioles back when they were really good, but he was like uh, Frank Cashin's right-hand man. And so he, he rented an apartment. He had an apartment down there in Norfolk, Virginia, Tidewater where the Mets triple A team was. So he was at most of our games and anytime they needed a player. They needed to really know what was going on. The people in New York, they called DJ because he's at all our games watching. And, uh, you know, I, I just sit around and talk with him, talk about the game sometime. And then when I got into coaching also, I'd run into him in the same kind of setup. And he'd ask me questions and I'd ask him questions, you know. And, and uh, so those, those those three guys, but pr primarily Chuck and, uh, and DJ were the, were the two most inf influential in, in pro ball. Two wonderful men, you know, and, and uh, that's one thing. I've, you know, uh, I've met some great people. I've, I've played under some great people in the game. And then, like, some of my great, great friends like you two that, you know, I met in this game. And, and I, you know, I miss that, you know, especially with all this stuff going on. We're all isolated, you know, and, and uh, you, you miss the, you know, you miss your, you miss your fans, your friends, you know. Yeah. Well, we do, John. We miss you. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and but you guys look better than ever. <laughs> There is former Toronto Blue Jays manager John Gibbons 
Tom, it was a rather lengthy conversation with Gibby, but it was so well worth it. He was completely raw, uncensored, and we got everything out of Gibby. And that was a fantastic chat. And once again, there were our insiders. We only had four of them that joined. We have a lot more than four insiders, but only four of them took advantage of this opportunity. We want more of you win. We could have had three or four more in that chat room. Tom, how can people get in on these Zooms and chat with people like Gibby? Well, before I tell them that, I'm going to tell them, you know, I just read something last week that said that Gibby is actually advertising he will do a personalized greeting for your birthday, for, you know, for a birthday surprise for somebody. I think it costs $50 a greeting. Wow. For, for a personalized greeting from Gibby. And apparently he does amazing ones. So I'll give him a plug for that. For 50 bucks, you can have Gibby. But for three bucks a month, at patreon.com which is 36 bucks for a year 36 bucks for a year you can sit in with a talk with a direct talk not just a pre-recorded message with blue jays past and present with people from the organization (laughs) and future and you can sit in every week with us so patreon.com slash out of the park join us three dollars a month five dollars a month heck if you want to give us 50 bucks a month, we'll take yeah. it. Oh, yeah, you're more than welcome to do that. <laughs> but, for th- but for three bucks in a month, you can sit in on these talks. Yes. And you can talk right with Gibby and ask him questions. Yeah, and it's a great way to help support the podcast as well. As you know, this is how we you know, make money off this show. And we provide a product, and it's nice that you, if you can help us in any way. Uh, even if you don't want to become a regular member, you're more than welcome to make a one-time donation, too. We'll take that. We'll take whatever we can get from you. We're going to continue to bring you these amazing shows each and every week, and we're glad to have you aboard. And, Tom, I tell you what, if you were in my clubhouse, I'd probably want to beat the crap out of you, too. But at the end, I'd give you a nice big hug. <laughs> well, that, it's the dynamics of every great team, Barry. Yes. And then I'd probably want to beat you up again, but good luck with that. All right, Tom, thank you, and thanks to all of you for making us a part of your week.